Chapter 14, Churchill and Haldane, Buying Time and Telling Lies. <clears throat> that special meeting of the Committee of Imperial Defense on the 23rd of August, 1911, was a pivotal moment on the road to the secret elite's war. Realization dawned that the Navy had to be given a similar shakeup to the Army and be fully aligned with the secret war plans. The Minister for War was alarmed by the highly dangerous position caused by the grave divergence of policy, which, had Britain gone to war, might have involved us in a disaster. He despaired of the fact that admirals live in a world of their own. It was a task that Haldane wanted to take up himself, believing that he was the only person equipped to cope with the in intransigence intransigence ask with agreed to shake up ask with agreed to a shake up he had been particularly annoyed when trying to get immediate information to discover that all the admiralty staff took their summer holidays at the same time it was effectively shut Haldane was shocked that inside the admiralty they had no strategic maps of Europe at all since it was not their business. Even although he had been elevated to the House of Lords as Viscount earlier in 1911 and was, favored, and was a favored son of the secret elite, Haldane was not chosen to lead the Navy. The task went to the jubilant Winston Churchill, who had pestered both Asquith and Sir Edward Grey to be given the post. The story goes that Asquith shut Haldane and Churchill together in a room at his holiday home near North Berswick, North Berwick and let them argue out who should be in charge. Churchill claimed that he had been offered the key job while walking off the golf links at North Berwick. Whatever the case, Churchill brought a fresh burst of energy to the Admiralty and shook it hard. His mission was clear-cut to put the fleet in a state of instant and constant readiness for war. Churchill was a culture shock for those who had grown accustomed to naval tradition. Officers and resident clerks were required to remain on duty night and day, lest a surprise attack from Germany caught them unawares. One of the sea lords had henceforth to be on duty at all times, in or near the Admiralty building, and Churchill ordered a huge chart of the North Sea to be placed on the wall behind his chair, on which the daily disposition of the German fleet was marked with flags. He injected the Admiralty with a sense of clear and present danger and put the department on a war footing. He ordered all naval magazines to be put under constant guard. It was a measure of the paranoia generated by the spy stories that Churchill made such immediate moves. Always a self-publicist, Churchill took credit for all that worked well. The Admiralty had commissioned oil-powered warships before he became First Lord. By February of 1914, the Navy had built, or was in the process of building, a grand total of 252 vessels, that were either fitted for burning oil fuel only or fitted to burn oil and coal in combination so that so the decisions clearly premeditated so that the decision clearly predated Churchill but he was credited with this radical change it all added up to a navy that was permanently prepared for war which was exactly what the secret elite expected from from a first lord of the admiralty. Uh, even with pliant and trusted men in the cabinet, the secret elite had to keep their plan for war under tight wraps. Had the public known of their intentions to manipulate a war with Germany, the government would have been swept from office. The regular meetings between military strategists from France and Britain that had been taking place in secret since 1905. Sanctioned by Asquith, Gray, and Haldane were still only known to a privileged free. 
the secrecy. Uh, were still only known to a privileged few, but secrecy was not easily maintained. Those in the know were bound to grow in number as the work of the Committee of Imperial Defense expanded. Foreign ministers and diplomats heard unconfirmed whispers or were included in confidential briefings. Newspaper editors and owners had sight of information that was kept from the public domain but it could not last. By November of 1911, sources from different parts of Europe made confident claims that secret deals had been done, deals that bound Britain to France and Russia through military and naval agreements that were repeatedly and officially denied in Parliament and in public. There was a a furious row in Asquith's cabinet on the 15th of November, when details of the secret meeting of the Committee of Imperial Defense to which Asquith had summoned both Churchill and Lloyd George came to the attention of a number of ministers who had not been invited. Lord Morley himself, a very senior minister, demanded an explanation about the joint planning between the French and Britain general staffs. How could this have come about? Who sanctioned it? How could this have happened without the knowledge and approval of the cabinet? What precisely did it mean in terms of international commitments? No matter how much the Relugus three squirmed, they could not find an answer to one telling question. If the, conserv- if the conversations really did not commit the country to war, why should information be withheld? Sir Edward Gray's lame and utterly insincere analysis of the conspiracy to keep the cabinet in ignorance, as recorded in his official memoirs, meekly claimed there was no reluctance to have the whole matter discussed at the cabinet. The only difficulty arose from the thing having gone on the only difficulty arose from the thing having gone on so long without the cabinet generally being informed. Apparently, Gray, Haldane, and Asquith had simply forgotten to inform cabinet members in 1905 and never got round to bringing up the issue thereafter. What a pathetic excuse. It was an awkward experience for the Relugus Three. Gray admitted that he regarded the agreements as a commitment to cooperation and military action for France. If that action was non-provocative and reasonable, if that action was non-provocative and reasonable, Asquith took a different, a different tack. He said that he still felt himself free under any circumstances to refuse Britain's cooperation. The general reaction around the cabinet table was one of anger and anxiety. At best, only five ministers were in the know. Asquith, Haldane. Gray, Churchill, and Lloyd George. The other 13 could clearly see that military reciprocities meant that, like it or not, Britain was at least partially committed to France in the event of a war. Two cabinet resolutions were formally tabled and passed unanimously. The first stated that No communication should take place between the general staff here and the staff of other countries which can, directly or indirectly, commit this country to military or naval intervention. The second resolution ordained that such communications, if they related to concerted action by land or sea, should not be entered into, into without the previous approval of the cabinet. The Liberal cabinet tried to assert some semblance of damage limitation. They genuinely believed that they had drawn a line in the sand before matters spiraled out of control, and they were wrong. Challenged in Parliament, Asquith was was forced into denial. He resolutely assured the House of Commons, there is no secret arrangement of any sort or any kind which has not been disclosed and fully disclosed to the public. In a parliamentary debate on foreign policy, Gray reiterated the lie. First of all, let me try to put an end to some of the suspicions with regard to secrecy, suspicions with which it seems to me some people are torturing themselves 
and certainly worrying others. There are no other secret engagements. Asquith repeated his assurances, assurance a month later, strenuously insisting that there are no secret engagements with any foreign governments that entail upon us any obligation to render military or naval assistance to any other power. These repeated blatant lies were blanket denials of everything that they had sanctioned over the previous five years. The subtext was of serious concern to the secret elite. The British cabinet and parliament were clearly ill-disposed to war with Germany and had been alerted to commitments that they rejected absolutely. Such, potenti such potentially serious objections had to be circumvented. The secret and lies continued unabated. The secret elite sent an emissary to Berlin on the 29th of January, 1912, in the guise of King Edward VII's personal banker, Sir Ernest Cassell. He and his German shipping mag magnate friend Albert Bolin requested a private audience with the Kaiser in which a document was passed to him, allegedly prepared with the approval and knowledge of the English government. It appeared to be a formal offer of neutrality, conditional on the reappraisal of the proposed German naval program. Cassell had been sent in secret directly to the Kaiser, without the apparent foreknowledge of the ambassadors of either country. The British cabinet was consequently told that a message had been sent from the Kaiser through Bolin, asking Sir Edward Grey to come to Berlin to discuss armaments free from all entanglements entanglements. The British Foreign Secretary later claimed dubity dubiously over the origins of the invitation. Dubiety dubiety whatever. I never knew whether the suggestion had really emanated from a British or a German source. Of course he knew, web upon web of outright lies covered his personal memoirs. The secret elite colluded with Gray, Churchill, and Asquith in using Sir Ernest Cassell as the secret emissary. Churchill liest, liest directly. Churchill liaised directly with Cassell, who reported back to the Admiralty. Gray did not go to Berlin on the flimsy excuse that he was required to deal with a miners' strike that was not even within his remit. Once the inner cabal had decided that Richard Haldane, the Minister of War, would be sent to Berlin as the British representative, Gray, Churchill, Haldane, and Sir Ernest Cassell drafted a reply predicated upon the belief that in both countries, Naval expenditure is open to discussion, and there is a fair prospect of settling it favorably. Here once more we find that small shaft of light that catches the secret elite in action. They used a high-powered international financier and his German contact to secretly approach Berlin. Cassell was much more than a mere message boy. He negotiated directly with the Kaiser to set up the meeting, took the reply secretly to Churchill, and helped draft the telegram that was sent back to Berlin. What power and influence did that demonstrate? In contrast, Haldane had no power to negotiate a treaty, treaty, and indeed, his instructions were explicitly not to bind or commit Britain to any, any pact. His visit raised hope inside Germany that they could establish a new era of cooperation and friendliness with Berlin. Chancellor Bethmann confided, confided to Haldane that for two and a half years he had been striving to bring about an agreement between Germany and England. Haldane had no much mandate, had no such mandate, nor any such intention. Mainstream historians regularly describe what followed as the Haldane mission. Its object was to reconcile, if possible, the differences between the two governments. Their view is that the mission failed because of Germany's unwillingness to, unwillingness 
to cease building a strong navy. This is completely untrue. Before Haldane's departure, Gray assured the French ambassador that there was no question of opening negotiations with Berlin. His only desire was to learn the wishes of the German government and obtain information about the German fleet program. In other words, Gray accepted that German hand of their naval program. Haldane had been instructed to block any commitment to peace and negotiations, yet his mission has been portrayed as having been thwarted by German intransigence in rejecting British offer, offers from, for naval reductions. Haldane's mission was to get hold of as many details as he could about German's naval plan and promise nothing. Despite an inflammatory speech by Winston Churchill delivered in Glasgow on the same day that Haldane arrived in Berlin, the Minister for War was cordially received. Churchill had claimed that Britain's fleet was a necessity, while the German fleet was a luxury, a provocation calculated to offend many in Britain and Germany who sincerely hoped for a better understanding between the two nations. Perhaps he was just saber-rattling or mindful that Haldane's visit was unpopular with Britain's allies, trying to give reassurance that the Admiralty had not gone soft on increased shipbuilding. He may even have considered that his stance would put pressure on the Kaiser and his advisors and add weight to Haldane's position in Berlin. But in fact, this was simply one more shameful pretense, a charade behind which Gray and the office, the foreign office constantly confused their German counterparts. On his arrival, Haldane promised that Berlin was against any aggression by any nation and repeated the great lie that we have no secret treaties. The Germans did not question his integrity and eagerly pursued a mutual agreement on benevolent neutrality, neutrality. If either became entangled in a war where it was not the aggressor, all of the enthusiasm for compromise stemmed from the Germans. The Kaiser presented Haldane with a copy of their proposal naval building program. To Haldane's surprise, he had no objection to my communicating it privately to my colleagues. I simply put the documents in my pocket. I got some small modifications agreed to in the tempo of battleship construction and a little in reduction of expenditure on both sides. Without a single concession or quid pro quo, the Germans agreed to drop one dreadnought from their program and postpone another two. The Chancellor and the Kaiser were elated at the prospects of future understandings raised by these conversations with, with Haldane, and Bethman promised that the success of the ongoing Anglo-German negotiations was the greatest object of my life now. They were like two Dickensians, Dickensian, they were like two Dickensian gentlemen who had had their pockets picked by a master but conned into surrendering part of their family jewels and believed naively that they had received something of worth in an empty promise. Convinced that considerable progress was made, had been made, Bethman sent a note to Gray on the 3rd of March summarizing the three days of satisfactory conversation and, suggest, and suggesting a formula for political understanding. Armed with the details of the new German naval law and empowered with the information Haldane had gleaned from, uh, about naval German strength, of German naval strength, the British Foreign Office replied that Haldane had not appreciated the magnitude of the new naval law nor made any unsanctioned promises. Undaunted, the Germans promised to withdraw the proposed fleet law as it stood and return for a pledge of German of British neutrality. Gray made the uh, the usual spurious claim that Britain will neither make nor join in any unprovoked attack upon Germany, but would not use the word neutrality. The Foreign Office pre prevaric the Foreign Office prevaricated by asking more questions, demanding more ex better explanations 
and seeking complicated data that would take time to compile. After months of inaction, it slowly dawned on the gullible Kaiser that he had been the victim of an insincere political maneuver to slow down his naval program. Such was Haldane's mission. Undoubtedly, undoubtedly, uh, where am I? Undoubtedly, Britain's secret military and naval commitments to France had been the backbone of British foreign policy since 1906. By the time Asquith and Gray were obliged to deny suggestions that secret agreements had been made with France, Haldane's plan to mobilize and concentrate the highly trained British expeditionary, expeditionary force on the Belgian border had been in place for a year. Churchill was not so fortunate. Vital Navy vital naval coordination with France and Russia had yet had yet to be agreed. Churchill was never one who felt the need to play by the rules. The cabinet resolution was going to hold him back. Secret naval agreements went ahead, dressed in the garb of an admiralty reorganization. He used the occasion of his report to Parliament on the 18th of March 1912 to stoke the flames of German antagonism and make bold alterations to fleet displacement that presaged the preparations for war. The First Lord of the Admiralty loved these formal occasions in the House of Commons. The cut and thrust of the verbal duel fired his determination to have his way. He invited the Germans to take a holiday that year. He proposed that if the German Navy built no ships in 1912 to 1913, neither would Britain. On the face of it, both countries would benefit, and the savings Germany would gain by cancelling three dreadnoughts would be accompanied by the saving that Britain would make by not building five new super dreadnoughts. But Churchill couldn't stop reveling in his own acid wit. He pompously added that the five dreadnoughts wiped out by such an arrangement were more than I expect they could hope to do in a brilliant naval action. There was no naval holiday. Insulted by the British attitude, the German government proceeded to table new navy and army laws some four days later. Churchill warned that his initial naval estimates would have to be increased from their original 44 million pounds in the next year if Britain was to maintain its level of superiority. When the German plans were passed in the Reichstag, he promptly presented a million pound supplement to his original estimate and accelerated the British program, the British building program. While he appeared to be offering a solution to Germany in that they could accept the naval holiday, he was raising the stakes in a reckless game of overspend. Churchill was Churchill then surprised the packed House of Commons by announcing changes to the deployment of the British fleets. He moved the Atlantic fleet from Gibraltar to the North Sea and the Mediterranean fleet from Malta to Gibraltar, leaving only a small number of cruisers there. The North Sea fleet was to be boasted to three battle squadrons. What message did that spell out to the German naval staff? What was the British Navy planning to do? Members of Parliament were on their fleet members of Parliament were on their feet pointing out the very obvious dangers to Egypt and Britain gain and British grain supplies if these could not be defended by a sizable British Mediterranean fleet. Churchill stood firm and answered his critics, but they wanted both a reasonable preponderance of naval strength in the North Sea and a fleet in the Mediterranean. What Churchill had proposed was in line with secret agreements already worked out between, between the British and French naval staffs, and on that very same day, the French and Russian governments also agreed a secret joint naval pact. He could not tell cabinet because they had expressly forbidden such commitments. Secret elite had little interest in what the collective cabinet thought, and their agents knew this well. Churchill, accompanied by Asquith, had met with Lord Kitchener at Malta 
in May of 1912 and discuss how the British and French fleets could be better stationed to, max to maximize their advantage over Germany. While the issue of what comprised the Mediterranean fleet took up heated parliamentary time, Churchill had already agreed the joint naval strategy for war. Although the cabinet instructed Sir Edward Grey on that very day, the 16th of July, 1912, to remind the French government that anything that was agreed between the naval and military experts must not be taken as a commitment to assist in a war. He and Churchill took the secret elite strategy in the opposite direction. On the 22nd of July, 1912, the Royal Navy reduced its Mediterranean fleet to a fragment of its former strength. The Atlantic fleet joined with the home fleet to create battle squadrons ready to challenge the German high seas fleet. At the same time, France moved its entire battleship strength from Brest on the Atlantic coast to the Mediterranean to challenge the notional power of the Austrians and Italians. Italy was never likely to join in naval operations with Austria against Britain, and the Admiralty knew this, but the pretense served its purpose. And thus, without the permission or approval of the cabinet or parliament, Britain and France entered into active naval coordination in preparation for war at sea. They were committed to a focused mutual responsibility. When war was declared, the Royal Navy would protect France's Atlantic and Channel coasts, while the French Navy would protect British interests in the Mediterranean. Let there be no doubt about it, this agreement sanctioned British action if the German Navy attacked the coast of France. That alone made nonsense of all the claims of non-intervention in the time of war. A country cannot stay neutral, but agree to defend one side's interests. The ordinary members of Parliament had no inkling of these decisions. In the towns and cities of Great Britain, the populace got on with the business of the day, ignorant of the progress that was steadily being made towards war. Strikes in the docks, civil unrest in Ireland, suffragette disruption of the, and the Olympic Games in Stockholm provided suitable distraction. The British press depicted the withdrawal of battleships from Malta and their new role in patrol in the North Sea as a response to the continuing German naval buildup. They painted a picture of Germany rebutting Britain's attempt to achieve a slowdown in the naval race of Germany ignoring Winston Churchill's naval holiday. It was always Germany's fault. All of the suspicions all of, these, all of the suspicions aired in Parliament were fully justified. Commitments, albeit verbal, had been made and were clearly understood. Under pressure from the French to have a written commitment, Gray broke his own rule and finally relented. It was an act he would have caused it was an act he would have caused to regret. He did not permit a formal diplomatic exchange, but instead he wrote a private letter to the French ambassador in London, Paul Cambone, on the 22nd of November, 1912. It stated that the disposition of the French and British fleets respectively at the present moment is not based upon an engagement to cooperate in war. His weasel words were mere sophistry and hinged around the phrase, at the present moment. The only point that mattered was the future intention when a declaration of war would change everything. The decision to relocate the fleets was taken by Churchill, who promised that the French coast would be protected by the Royal Navy was inextricably linked to the overall strategy to maximize the concentration of British power against the German Navy. Cambon's reply to Gray became the definitive example of Sir Edward's insincerity and cover-up, but that will be dealt with later. The Navy had been brought into line with the Committee of Imperial Defense, and the preparations for war. The army had been reconstructed by Haldane and Escher, Escher, and its commitment was not questioned. But strangely, its leadership remained under the spell of powerful old influences, which need to be closely considered. Summary 
Chapter 14, Churchill and Haldane Buying Time and Telling Lies The secret elite realized that major changes were needed to modernize the administrations of the Royal Navy, and Asquith chose Winston Churchill to put the fleet into a state of readiness for war. Churchill continued the Admiralty's high spending regime with a program that included a major switch from coal power to oil power. When details of the secret meeting of the Committee of Imperial Defense in August became known, there was an unholy role in Cabinet. It was the first time that they learned about the conversations with France that had been going on since 1905. Angry Cabinet members passed two unanimous resolutions that banned commitments to any foreign powers without their express repro- expressed approval. In Parliament, both both Asquith and Gray repeatedly deny that Britain had made any secret commitments to any foreign power. An invitation from the Kaiser led to Viscount Haldane's visit to Germany in February of 1912. In fact, the initial approach had been made through secret elite agents. The net result of Haldane's so-called mission was that Britain gained advance warning of the German naval plans. And Germany was deceived into thinking that some agreement of neutrality might be possible. Despite the clear instructions of cabinet, Churchill reorganized the British fleet in a secret negotiation with the French. The French repeatedly wanted written confirmation of Britain's commitment to them in a war with Germany. Uncharacteristically, Gray penned a vague letter to the ambassador Paul Cambon that was later to cause him embarrassment.